get a text before I got here, which I read once I got here, which said, Rick said to do the speed limit when you hit Clemson City Limits, speed traps today. <laughs> As a father with a freshman at Clemson who just got a text saying, quote, Dad, don't be mad. Uh, <laughs> I know about Clemson speed traps. Um, her first sentence was unsuccessful. Um, I can assure you it didn't work. <clears throat> Let me tell you a little bit about SCMA for those of you who don't know, although I see at least one member sitting over there, Bill. Uh, so, uh, but for those of you who don't know, we're the trade association that represents the manufacturing community in South Carolina. And uh, so you'll know I'm not texting. I've got my phone in front of me so that I don't go too long, which some of you are going to be happy about. Uh, we represent the manufacturing community. Our membership is pretty much a who's who of the manufacturing community in South Carolina. Uh, we started out as the Textile Manufacturing Association for our first hundred or so years. And for the last uh, almost 20 now, we have been diverse. Textiles are still a big part. In fact, I'm gonna mention textiles a little bit because of what's going on in the textile industry. For example, how many of you think the textile industry is pretty much had it on its way out? Well, you're all afraid to raise your hands because Bill Steen's sitting right there, maybe. But, uh, but, but really, if you get people to think about it and be honest, they will tell you, they'll all raise their hands. And, and I start out by saying it's not your father and your grandfather's textile factory uh, anymore, or industry, and the materials that are being made are, are very advanced. In fact, a lot of that work um, starts in, in, here at Clemson in the Advanced Materials Department. And we've actually seen literally several dozen economic development announcements in textiles over the last few years. And so when you think about SCMA, you think about Boeing and BMW, you also have to think about Milliken and Central Textiles and, and Alice Manufacturing and others. Because not only have they been there for a long time, they have started to see some good things happen over the last few years. Who would have thought, for example, and I bet Bill would have thought that we'd see a textile machinery manufacturer <coughs> make an announcement in South Carolina again. And we had one in Spartanburg a couple of years. The reason I say that is because, and I start off with textiles, is because when you're talking about workforce, that industry has the same challenge, in fact, maybe a greater challenge than most of my others because of a couple of characteristics. And when I say it's not your father or your grandfather's textile mill anymore, uh, my dad started out as a supervisor at Woodside Mill back in the 60s and finished up in the apparel industry as a vice president for Umbro back in the 90s is when he retired. And so I had an opportunity about ten, eight or nine years ago to take him to a cotton mill in the upstate. He knew exactly what he was saying when he left. Uh, we were outside and he said, well, three things. I could see, I could hear, and where the hell was everybody? Uh, because Woodside Mill had several hundred people on a shift and making a fraction of what they were making in this facility uh, with 14 or 15 people on that shift running some very sophisticated machinery. I'll get back to Texas in a minute. Manufacturing in South Carolina, though, has had a pretty good two or three years. I think it's all been relative, though. It, there's a great argument it should have been greater. Um, there should have been more job creation going on. Uh, and it's not been because the state hasn't been aggressive with economic development, because it has. I, I would tell you that it's because government, and mostly from Washington, D.C., has been a great impediment to hiring and will continue to be. I'm not going to go into a speech on Obamacare, but if you are having a really good day and you're feeling too euphoric, and you need to be brought down, you need to go and see a presentation on Obamacare and what it's gonna mean, and you will need, um, you'll need drugs or therapy or something because we had, a, we had a James Alessio who makes one of the best presentations you can imagine from Blue Cross, one of the brightest people you'll meet, come and speak to our textile council a couple of weeks ago, and I wasn't kidding when I said I asked a question, and I said, James, I really wish that I had gotten a motivational speaker comedian to follow you uh, because we really needed one after that. It, it's not going to be good. And it has had a profound impact on hiring and that sort of thing. That being said, the good news for the workforce and for the potential for increasing uh, our opportunities out there is still there. And it, it could get better. Uh, manufacturing, like I said, has seen somewhat of a resurgence since 2009. I had one member who came up to me in January 2009 and said, Lewis, our company's been around for 100 years and all we've ever done is make money. Lots of it. And then he said, and there's no business right now. I see him about nine or 10 months later and he's got a grin on his face about this big. And I said, is there business now? And he said, a little bit. 
Now, that guy was in the textile industry. A little bit means a lot. Um, that can be the gloomiest group of people, even when they're doing well. They're all sitting there acting like this, like nothing's going on good. If you see that look from them, it might be all right right then. Um, <clears throat> they can play poker with the best of them. Anyway, so things started to turn around in the middle of 2009, and we've seen a resurgence of automotive, uh, textiles, advanced materials, aviation, all have done well. The wood product industry is coming back in South Carolina. Uh, you are seeing uh, the, the, the industries that serve the housing industry start to see it. The first people to come back in that were the folks who were into the remodeling and really provided materials to places like Home Depot and Lowe's for remodeling because that was the first thing people did as they started to feel a little bit better about the economy and they weren't willing to invest in the house or they couldn't get the loans for the house, but they could fix up what they had and so you started to see that come back a little quicker. And now we started to hear a new word. I want you to Google this word when you have not right now. When you have a chance and uh, look up the word reshoring. Now I'm not sure if the word reshoring existed five or six years ago. Maybe it did. Um, and, and I'm not going to spend the time to look it up and see if it <laughs> did exist at that time. But it certainly has entered our vernacular now. And it's something I hear all the time. <clears throat> There's lots of reasons for reshoring occurring. And what that is, <clears throat> is that companies are bringing the jobs back to the United States. Now, they're not bringing them back in the same numbers, and I don't think they're going to. Uh, but to put it in perspective, I've got a member that's got 17,000 Chinese employees. They will eliminate 5,000 of those jobs sometime in the next 18 months and hopefully bring 600 jobs to this state or another. And that tells you, that shows you the scale of what we're talking about. And there are reasons why that's being done. Not only the logistics costs, but the fact that the Chinese have moved their facility from right on the shore to 10 miles back, and then 15, and now 75 miles inland, because that suits the Chinese, and they don't like that. They don't like the fact that they've been moved. And the second thing is, is China's not the low-cost producer it once was in some areas. And in fact, one thing to keep in mind about the Chinese issue, and it's a big issue for manufacturing in this country, is everything has happened quickly in China. Everything has happened faster than you thought it would. I visited China in 1986 and went to Shanghai. Anybody here been to Shanghai lately? You would not recognize the Shanghai I went to in 1986 because we stayed in the first privately owned hotel in China, in the entire country. And to show you, to put in perspective where that country was at the time, that hotel was owned by the only group of people in the country who had money. Anybody want to guess who they were? They had money. They had something that the average person could buy. They made something or produced something the average person could buy. Farmers. The farmers had the money, and that's the way society evolves anyway. They had the money. Those who could hunt and hunt, and those who could grow, first people to be able to sell. And so they had some extra money, and now you go to Shanghai, and it's a completely different world. <clears throat> but China's no longer the place uh, that it was. It's still formidable, and it's still is something we have to consider all the time. But Vietnam, Bangladesh, and others are still out there, and they're stepping into that realm. Nevertheless, jobs are starting to come back, at least to some degree. And that creates a workforce challenge in South Carolina that just compounds what we were already facing. So I'm going to give you some statistics off the cuff, any metal statistics. Don't go back and check them because I'm not making them up, but I'm not that far away from making them up. Um, <laughs> these are things I've been told by my members as I go around the state and talk to them. Before the financial collapse, Michelin told me that they were four or five years away from 50 to 60 percent of their South Carolina workforce being of uh, retirement age. Now, people have delayed that, but still, you see the issue. DuPont told me before the collapse that they were two years away from 50 percent of their American workforce, over 30,000 people, and they've got 60 something thousand in the uh, in the country being a retirement age. Go to a textile facility these days and look and see what the employees look like. They're old. Uh, they are, in fact, I have seen, I think the biggest number I've seen on a helmet, not all companies have, have the uh, helmets with the numbers, but I've seen a 56-year service helmet in the last 18 months. Uh, but the workforce is aging and it causes all kinds of problems, but just as importantly, it creates a need to replace them. <coughs> And now that the economy has stabilized a little bit and is starting to look a little better, the folks are starting to think about retiring again. People who delayed it a few years are now thinking about retiring or they just have no choice because they're, they're of age now 
to where they can't continue to work in a manufacturing environment. So the workforce is diminishing in terms of what we already have, plus the jobs are becoming a lot more sophisticated. <clears throat> the problem becomes even more so when you think about the sophistication of those jobs and the kinds of tasks that need to be done in a modern manufacturing facility. I was asked in 2004 by a national public radio <clears throat> reporter what I thought about the loss, in job, the loss of jobs in South Carolina, and we were talking about it, and she said, well, aren't those a lot of low-skilled, low-paying jobs? And I said, with all due respect, my members don't have those anymore. That's not what's going on in manufacturing today in South Carolina. And nine years later, folks, it's no different. In fact, it's even more so. Think about the products that are being made here right now. You know, and the obvious ones are so easy to talk about. The X5, BMW said at one point, that's the most sophisticated machine they've ever built. Certainly, uh, 787 is an incredibly complicated, sophisticated machine. But think about the ones that have been being made here for a long time. Take a look at how tires are developed. Go look at the facility that Michelin has in Lexington, South Carolina, where they make the 14-foot tires that go from, I think, fifty to $60,000 retail. And on the aftermarket, since they're commodities and in such demand, they go for a lot more than that. <clears throat> and Bridgestone is getting ready to do the same thing. Those are very, very sophisticated products. Think about the fabric that goes into uh, the military uniforms that our soldiers wear. Very sophisticated. Polymers that you can't even begin to imagine. The Advanced Materials Department here at Clemson, when I first uh, visited that, John Bellotta took me on a tour. Um, any of you see the movie Independence Day? Remember when they went to see the ship that all the cool stuff came in on that they'd been hiding for years? Well, I would have thought Clemson had one hidden over there based on the stuff he was showing me. It was amazing. Anyway, you can't do those kinds of jobs the way folks used to. And the textile industry provided something else to South Carolina for about 15 or 20 years. It's running out now. And that is a group of displaced workers who were very trained or trainable people. And you can take those people and you can put them into places like General Electric where they make gas turbines or to Michelin or to BMW or to Honda or to any of those places. And it was pretty seamless. Now, well, that day's come and gone. Those people were retiring. So... There's an issue. There's a big issue for the manufacturing community in South Carolina. It's all about getting the right kind of workforce in. And the reshoring that's going on is going to be enjoyed by a number of states. But, and this is a big but, that didn't sound good. But anyway, they, this, a big qualifier. How about we do it like that? <clears throat> this is the problem. There are going to be states who miss that opportunity, who miss the reshoring, and the biggest reason, in my opinion, will not be because of tax policy. South Carolina's tax policy is pretty good. It won't be because of infrastructure with regard to ports or roads. We'll get there on those things. It'll be because of the infrastructure of workforce and whether or not we can provide it. Governor Haley uh, deserves an enormous amount of credit in this area, and she's not getting enough of it. She needs to start. And it's because the conversations we had with her quietly two summers ago about workforce, and it's because of her experience with the Continental Project. She heard the phrase, prove your workforce, and she heard it several times. And um, Secretary Hitt, who was our chairman for two years, uh, and I tell people this, and you know, kind of half-joking, kind of not, that uh, he's the first person in over 100 years to be chairman of SCMA two years in a row, and we got so tired of him, we begged Governor Haley to find something for him to do. <laughs> anyway, the two of them have been a great team for bringing jobs to South Carolina, and what they've done is understand the workforce challenge. And that's why you saw the governor in, embrace the work rate communities and why she has embraced the manufacturing skills certification, which we're trying to get for the technical college, uh, colleges in terms of funding and, and efforts there. Why she knows that her unique ability, having in her cabinet commerce and department of workforce, and having my next chairman, Mikey Johnson, be the chair of the statewide investment, excuse, workforce investment board is important. <laughs> why you heard her talk about it in the state of the state and why she has been around the state talking about workforce more and more and more because she knows if she's going to be successful she's got to show the companies we have the people so how do we get that done and where do we start on that well we're very lucky in South Carolina and we have to go back to Governor Hollings and thank him for it because it was an enormous incredible vision to create the technical college system in the state we have the best delivery mechanism for training the workforce certainly anywhere around here, maybe the country, maybe the world. 
uh, it's proven over and over again that it can get the job done. The only criticism I have, and it's not their fault, it's the way South Carolina views things in general, is that the technical college system is the very best at rising to the occasion and saying we can get it done. And when I say that, I mean, Boeing's getting the people they need. They're manufacturing clean airplanes down there, and that's a technical term, a term of art. And it's, it's talking about how those planes roll off to the fall of and it's, it's amazing how it's being done. GE has always gotten the workers they needed in Greenville. And by the way, they were BMW before BMW in Greenville. Uh, BMW has the folks that they need, 7,000 of them. Michelin, Michelin, go right down the line. And when we announce the new projects, we go to work, the General Assembly appropriates the money, and we meet the need. And so the company doesn't really understand the difference until they've been here for a while. And then they're dealing with getting people in. <clears throat> and <clears throat> what we're finding is, is the skills that the folks in South Carolina have don't match the jobs that we are able to offer. And so the governor and Bobby Hitt understand that and have seen that we have to get those two ships that are passing in the night to meet each other at some point. So you, you, you'll hear from folks who have been involved in, in Elizabeth and, and others in the work ready communities. And, the good news is, is I'm not involved in that on a, on a regular basis, uh, on, on a daily basis, because it's been an enormous amount of work, more than I'd like to do. Um, I try very hard to take as much credit for it as I can because of James Rister, uh, who works for me, being a participant in it, but those who know better know that I'm making that up too. <clears throat> We've got to make sure the technical college system is able to meet our needs. Think about it is, Satellite Health a few years ago did a funding initiative with the technical college system and it's been very successful and it has resulted in them meeting some of the needs that they have with regard to a shortage of workers. We got to do the same thing in manufacturing and the technical college system, we're actually using their Allied Health initiative as proof that they can get the job done. We're using every time that we've had a major announcement and they're able to produce the employees that we need as proof that they can get the job done. It's as good a money as you can spend in state government, and we need to keep doing it. Now, it's expensive to do it. One thing that impresses you when you go to a technical college system or, or, or facility is to see, if you go to their out health part, you go and you see that these, these x-ray stations and, and the dental hygiene stations, all that, they've got to be expensive. And those things have got to come from somewhere, and the funding's got to be there for them. The same thing with our machines. We can't donate, donate them all, folks, from the manufacturing community. Some of you from technical colleges might be sitting out and saying, we haven't donated any hardly lately, so you know, what are you talking about? But the state's got to step up with their funding. We are asking for about $7 million uh, for manufacturing skill certification. Let me explain that if ever. We were of the opinion, Otis Roll and I at the state chamber, we worked very closely with them on workforce issues, that instead of the state agency asking for the money, the business community needed to do it. We needed to go with the general, to the General Assembly and say, we need you to do this money. So when Ways and Means was talked to last week, no offense to the technical college system, uh, there weren't any technical college people there uh, present. It was just business community representatives talking to the Ways and Means community, excuse me, subcommittee chairman about the need for this funding. Uh, what we've said is we need them, we trust them, they can get the job done, you need to give them the money. And we've gotten very good reception to that. Now I may be jumping around a little bit, but I'm going to tell you about two or three other areas that we think are important and that we're paying very close attention to and we're asking the General Assembly to fund. And then I'll tell you at the end, and there is an end coming, that I'll tell you at the end that uh, what we are doing at the Manufacturers Alliance to try to make this case even stronger. Here's one of the big problems I see when I go to a technical college. And I've been to all 16 at some point in the last 10 years, and I go to five or six a year at least for various reasons. And that is there's usually, there's always a room in the technical college that has got a bunch of students in there, and they're not working on any machines, and they're not at any workstations, and they're not learning anything that will do us any good immediately in a manufacturing facility. Anybody want to guess what they're learning how to do? Read and count. And that's a problem. That shouldn't happen. Now, it's a perfect world. We can't, we can't say that, that that won't happen, but that should not be going on in our technical colleges, folks. They need to come out of K through 12 knowing how to do that better because we got other things that the technical colleges need to do. And if we're wasting time and resources, it's not a waste, but if we're using time and resources teach people how to read and count, that delays what we need to get done in technical colleges. So that's a problem. So the um, 
Don't expect me to give you a big solution for it right now because if I had that, I probably wouldn't be standing here giving this speech. Um, I'd be making a lot of money as a consultant somewhere. Uh, but anyway, we've got to do something about that problem. And we have to realize that folks have got to come there ready. Now, the governor said something a couple of years ago about another issue in South Carolina that I'm going to touch on briefly, but don't discount it. And that is, we've got to have people who are clear-headed enough to come in and work. And folks, you don't want to know some of the statistics I've gotten. I'm not going to talk about them right now. For the quarter room, don't ask me. But you don't um, want to know some of the statistics I know about some of the difficulties my members have had getting people who are clear-headed enough to do the job. <clears throat> We've got to make sure that folks, when they come to the technical college, understand that they've got something on the other end. Uh, one of the things I've asked that group of folks when we're meeting with them to talk about and to understand is, please don't just put up that cool billboard that says, come here and we'll prepare you for, to be competitive in the world. We need the next step. We need, come here, we'll prepare you to get this job with this company. And there are companies in the state that can do that, and I think that's more of, of, of an effort. Um, I think that uh, you need to make sure in this state that we are advocating and, and extolling the virtues of STEM education in our high schools. One thing we told, and this may sound a little arrogant, but it's uh, the way that we believe they should look at it, is we've told members of the Ways and Means Committee, including the Chairman Brian White, who's incredibly supportive of this, to look at how our members spend their money and then follow it. Because our members will invest money in a good STEM program. Now, there are a lot of folks out there who figured that out, so guess what? There's a lot of folks that are knocking on their door saying, I can do STEMs, or I can do STEM, and let me help you do that. That's not going to work. We need people who really know what they're doing, and we need schools that are high schools that have professionals who understand what science, technology, engineering, <clears throat> and math training is all about and are putting together good programs. The Kate Centers are encouraging that are springing up around the state. Um, I know that my district, Lexington Richland 5, they have put together a world-class facility, and they will have very good curriculum. And more importantly, they will be meeting the needs of their customers, which are my members. Because guess what? They're talking to them. I would encourage technical colleges to do that too, is to continue the dialogue you have with your local industry and to understand exactly what they need. We have at times in the past seen that a school here or there might have been willing to produce something that industry didn't care too much about. Fortunately, that's a very rare occurrence in South Carolina. But still, it's something that continued communication will, will help with. The bottom line is this, what, we've, what we have embarked upon in the last month is we're working on a white paper at SCMA, which we have been able to secure a grant for to make the case for workforce development investment. Without going into the politics that we are facing right now in this world, the, the competition for dollars is going to be pretty intense. I always tell my friends, and I've got quite a few that supported uh, the president, said, you know, especially those that are in state government and that are going to see their budgets at risk, at grave risk, because Medicaid is sucking all the oxygen and all the money out of the room, folks. All the oxygen and all the money out of the room. And it is going to hurt our ability to build roads. It is going to hurt our ability to fund our schools. It is going to hurt our ability to train our workforce. And I'm telling you, it is going to consume our state budget at, on the path it's on. And we still have no idea how much Obamacare is going to cost, regardless of the path the state goes on. And so when you're looking at alternatives and things that have to be funded, you get concerned. And if I were in the business of K-12 through and technical colleges or higher ed, uh, the four-year colleges, which have an important role in workforce as well, then I would be very concerned every time I heard the word Medicaid. It's going to be a huge issue, folks. And it is going to pull at the very same resources we're trying to get access to. So we're working on that white paper because we have to make the case. And the case is being made through interviewing CEOs from around the state, South Carolina companies, South Carolina companies who are talking about what their workforce needs are going to be, how they're addressing them themselves, and what the state needs to do. Statistics and figures from the technical college system from commerce about the needs and about the demographics that exist in South Carolina, and a little bit of a case study about how on several occasions, including specific projects 
and Allied Health and technical colleges, when they've been given the money, have risen up and delivered the product that we need. In other words, General Assembly, you can trust these people. You can give them the money and we will get what we've asked for. <clears throat> that white paper hopefully will be done in the next six or seven weeks at the most. The interviews are pretty much complete and we'll have a product that we expect will be sponsored by in terms of rolling it out and endorsed by the major business organizations in the state and a couple of state agencies. It has to be the biggest priority other than roads and bridges and I put them about the same uh, to meet the needs of manufacturing in South Carolina. If we don't encourage workforce development, if we don't spend the money and look, you're looking at one of the most limited government people you'll ever meet in your life. You don't want to have a conversation with me about things government shouldn't be doing. But when it comes to building roads and bridges, when it comes to training people to work, you have got to do that on the government level. Certainly you've got to do it in partnership with private entities, and that's important, but South Carolina has a good record of doing that. What we have to do is remind a new generation of members of the General Assembly, and folks, it is a new generation. Anybody in here, you've heard the term term limits, and you've thought about term limits, we all hear it. People want to run people out of office, and they think they're there forever, and yeah, I'm for term limits, I'm from term limits. Well, let me tell you how term limits works in South Carolina. My friend Chip Huggins was elected in a special election in 1999. There are 124 members of the House, so he went in as number 124, his license plate, 124. Uh, he is now 27 or 28 after 14 years, and folks, that means over 90 in front of him have gone, but about 40 or 45 behind him have gone. So the General Assembly has turned over. We have 30 new members this year, 29 or 30 new members this year. They have to be educated about this. They don't understand it quite like some of their predecessors did. They'll get it, and that's why we're putting together that case study. We've got to make sure they understand that if we're going to take advantage of reshoring, if we're not going to miss this party, and to some extent it could be a really good thing, if we're going to see companies like ZF locate in places like Lawrence and they intend to manufacture one of the, if not, some argue it is, the most sophisticated products that goes into a car, uh, a nine-speed transmission, if they're going to do that in Lawrence, South Carolina, then they're going to have to have people who know how to do it, and that will determine whether or not we get the next ZF or the expansion of ZF or right on down the road because the days of cutting and sewing, the days of simple assembly work really don't exist in South Carolina anymore and they're not coming back. It is going to be continued, it's going to continue to be very sophisticated operations and it's going to take very sophisticated skill sets. And to put this in perspective, I went to Furman University undergrad, went to University of Georgia Law School. I'm a pretty well educated guy. Those are two great schools. Um, and uh, on August 31st, the University of Georgia will show the people here just how good they are. But uh, <laughs> I, I am talking big, you know. But um, the but that's pretty good education, folks. But you pretty much are looking at the only job my members would give me because I'm not qualified to do the work that they do in their facilities. In order to get that kind of job, I would need to go to Tri-County Tech, Trident Tech, Denmark Tech, Greenville Tech, Sparkburg Community College, Midlands Tech, you name it. That's where I would need to go to get the kind of education to work in those facilities. So my Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Furman University, uh, I'm still trying to think what I'd be doing right now if I didn't go to law school, and that's kind of a scary thought. We need people who know how to make things and know how to add value to products. I appreciate the opportunity. Again, sorry I'm late. Uh, Representative Gilda Cobb Hunter will not say she's sorry for making me late, uh, but that's okay. She's a great lady, and I had a great, good time meeting with her today. Thanks a lot. Listening to, to Lewis, I mean, you, you hear about a lot of the things that are going on around the state. We are so fortunate in this area to have seven school districts that, that we have with, with the kind of leadership that we have. A lot of good stuff going on with our career centers, uh, a lot of good stuff with our STEM activities. Uh, we could talk a long time about that.